Um, the topic is going to be the cost of zero cost. Um, I'm going to introduce really quickly what that means and why I would want to do what I'm going to do in this talk. Um, talk you through, yeah, um, I'll start with that. So what's the idea? I want to analyze code generated by the compiler um, and analyze that at the different stages of compilation. And we'll see in a few slides what that exactly means. Like compilers generally have intermediate representations. It goes through a lot of intermediate representations and then at the end generates assembly. Um, and since Rust promises zero cost abstractions, we would hope that that assembly is somewhat optimal considering what we're trying to do, right? So that's the idea. Um, why would one want to do that? Disclaimer. Um, first of all, curiosity. Definitely most important reason don't look too much at the other ones. Um, just because like, hey, let's look what that actually generates because that could be fun, right? Um, otherwise, maybe you want to understand details of an algorithm. In particular, abstractions in Rust can at times be actually very abstract. Like with macro rules macros or proc macros, you can write one macro and it expands to the universe, sort of, right? So you don't necessarily see what's going on in terms of algorithmic complexity or whatever. So maybe we want to look into that and what that actually does. Um, and then maybe looking at assembly or whatever could have, help us find bottlenecks in what we're doing. Could. Um, but because that's actually work, disclaimer, only do that like after proper benchmarking if you're sure that what you're looking at is actually something that matters for your performance. And only do that after you have looked at algorithmic complexity in terms of your real Rust code and not to start with. And yes, point one applies and you're curious, right? Um, okay, so what does compilation flow actually look like in Rust or sort of abstract? I've omitted parts that are not, well, let's say not observable to us. Um, so we start out with an input file that's a .rs Rust file um, and pass it into Rust C. And then Rust C has two intermediate representations. One is the HIR, the high-level intermediate representation, which is still very close to um, actual Rust, sort of an abstract syntax tree. I have another slides for each of those. Um, then we go down to mid-level intermediate representation, which is still fairly new, which is a bit lower level, um, actually expands a lot of the constructs in Rust out to simpler things, can do some things that the surface syntax of Rust cannot actually do. Um, and then that is in some way translated into LLVM IR. So the intermediate representation that LLVM has, which is the compiler backend that Rust uses to actually generate assembly code. Um, then we go into the LLVM library, which magically turns that into assembly. A uh, fun fact, LLVM internally also has an MIR, which is meshing level intermediate representation and closer to assembly. So that's not at all confusing. Um, right, so all of those are technically mostly data representations within the compiler. But as I said, those are those that we can observe because they also have a textual representation that we can output to a user. Um, and let's look at why is it missing an age. Um, let's look at each of the stages and how to get there. So our running example for this is going to be this, um, which is a very simple for loop that just prints numbers from 0 to 254. Um, and I've put a puts function in there, which is annotated as inline never. Um, and the sole reason for that is to make it more easy, make it easier to see what we're actually doing. Because the print on macro actually expands to a whole lot of code. And for this running example, I sort of just wanted to look at the for loop, because one of the first things you actually hear about Rust, hey, for loops with iterators, they are just as good as C style for loops. Um, so that's a pretty simple loop. It iterates through a few numbers. So I thought maybe a first like easy running sample would be to see like is that actually sort of like a C style loop, but then we don't want the whole garbage of a print on expansion in there. So we'll just always have a function called puts that's never inline, and then we can deal with that. Okay. Um, so first thing we could do, actually none of those intermediate representations, we can Rust C just let expand the macros, which only works on nightly, um, and it also <laughs> actually requires the option minus that unstable options because. Even the option to do that is unstable. Um, but what the option is, is dash dash pretty expanded, which will just do what it says. It expands all macros and dumps like this sort of the parsed Rust back at you. Um, I've put two ways here to do that. One is just if you have a single Rust file and what to do it, you can call Rust C directly, 
The other way is if you actually have a cargo project, there is the cargo rust C sub command per default, um, which allows you to run the whole cargo infrastructure, building dependencies and everything. You can pass it the parameters to build and release mode. You can build tests, build examples, all that, but also pass arguments to the actual Rust C compiler through it. And those arguments are then separated with the dash dash after your regular arguments, right? Um, so the first one, if you have just a file, the second one, if you have a whole like cargo crate. Okay, so what does that our running sound like to expand to? And I said, Printl is like a whole lot of stuff. It's basically everything from line nine to 20. And that's like after I've reformatted that a bit for readability. Um, and I think I'm not even going to go into it, in part also because I'm not overly familiar with how the formatting infrastructure in Rust actually works. But as we can see, it expanded into a lot of function calls. Um, it cut out parts of the original format string that you had, like the braces are gone. You have the part before the braces, which is an empty string. We have the part after the brace in a print line, which is a new line. Um, and then sort of just passing the arguments along in like fancy ways, doing matches to create eight bindings and all that. Um, but the more interesting part is down there, our for loop is still a regular for loop. Okay, that's a bit boring, but yeah. So next step, um, high level intermediate representation. As I said, it's roughly an abstract syntax tree if you're familiar with that concept from compiler design. Um, it sort of describes operations and their arguments in a tree form. Um, and in HIR, high level intermediate representation, pretty much all constructs in the surface language are expanded. In particular, what we'll see in a moment is for loops are actually expanded to a like lower level form. Otherwise, it still looks a lot like the surface language. Um, and the way to get that is actually very similar. You can also do that only in nightly compilers. Um, you can use dash z unpretty equals hir, and then an input file. Um, there's again the Ryan doing the Chicago Rust C, and there is Cargo Inspect by Matthias Endler, which is also sometimes in attendance of this meetup, which he introduced, I think, at FOSDEM this weekend. Um, and there's a link to, to that in particular, and there's a recording from FOSDEM if you want to look at that, um, which is sort of interesting because it deals in ways with a very similar topic, even though we didn't talk about this before, but he has a, I think, very different spin to doing talks than I do. Like he adds a lot more of the motivation for wanting to look at low level stuff, and I'm like sort of more the person to go into the nitty gritty, so to say. Um, right, so what that does is basically just the same thing as the above, but it tries to format the code, which more often than not, unfortunately, doesn't work, but oh well, and then actually prints it with color, um, with a color scheme onto the console in a less like view, which is kind of nice if you just want to have a quick look at something. Okay, that is, okay. So I did not put the HR on the slide, um, and you'll see the reason in a moment. Um, I'll make that a bit bigger. And the reason is pretty much this. Um, it's a lot. So I said we're not going to care about the, the print on, so um, everything up here is pretty much a print expansion, this time not with the nice reformatting that I did, but that's just the, exactly the output the compiler gave me. Um, so let's not care about that, actually. And jump down to the main function. Is that actually large enough for everyone to read? Oh, looking at the back? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so what we see is that the for loop is gone, right? Um, and actually it's gone quite a bit. We own, oh, the only loop construct we still have is actually a loop, which if you haven't seen it, because it's actually, even though it exists quite rare, even in Rust, um, it's an endless loop, unless you call break inside it or whatever. Um, and other things that I'll just superficially note is there is now a result variable, which holds the result of the function. And then it's actually like returned at the very end in the Rust style. Um, but other than that, um, we can see a few interesting things about for loops. The first thing we see is that the argument of the zine of the for loop is actually passed to into iter. And we pass it to into iter in a way that might also be seem a bit foreign to most of you, which is um, the name actually escapes me. I think 
a few different ones were floated. It's like the function call syntax for methods, sort of, or for trade methods. So we say explicitly call the interiter trade of the interiterator, the interiter method of the interiterator trade on a range, which turns that thing an interiter. Um, then we match over that. Interestingly enough, because it's it's not actually something you can match about that over. Um, and in line 29, it's bound to the name iter mutably, which is just an irrefutable pattern that will always match, and it just gives the thing a name. So that is, so to say, the same very same thing as writing let mod iter equals the interiterator call. But in the expansion, it's that for, for I think, actually lifetime reasons and different things. Um, and after that, it's pretty straightforward. Like in each iteration of the loop, we call the iterator next function on your iterator. If you have ever actually implemented an iterator, you'll know that it'll, it's the method of an iterator that gives you the next element, sort of obviously. Um, and it does it in the form of an option. Either it returns the sum of the option, which is the next element, or it returns none, in which case the iteration ended. And we can see here that this is exactly what it does for the for loop. Like it, if it's sum, it sets the next value to the value that was returned. And if it's none, it breaks the loop and the loop ends. Um, and unless the loop was broken, we then further assign <laughs> our next value to the variable e and pass that to puts. So, um, by the way, because I forgot to say that in the beginning, you can shout questions at me at any time. If they are longer than, like, say, two sentences, try to get the microphone, but just for the recording, but other than that, yeah, shout. Um, so yeah, that's, that's four loops, right? An endless loop, and then we get each element separately and break if the iteration ends. So one step further down the ladder, um, we can go from that high-level intermediate representation to mid-level intermediate representation. And what that is is sort of of a more simple core language. Um, and it's actually so simple that it's, I think, a bit horrendous to read. I don't know if I actually think it's, it's useful looking at it, but you can look at it, so I'll at least show it. Um, and it has, as I said before, some constructs that the service language actually doesn't have. Like, for example, it has go to. Um, like, you can go to, let's say, arbitrary positions in the code with an MIR which is supposedly safe because we generated from code that previously passed all the checks that the combat IS would do for borrow checking and all that. So we cannot sort of jump in the middle of a lifetime that we otherwise shouldn't be able to. Like the compiler makes sure of that when it generates the MIR and the processing. Um, other than that, it's structured in basic blocks. Um, quick show of hands, who is, which way do you want to ask it? Who is, not familiar with the concept of basic blocks. Basic what? Basic blocks. <laughs> yes. I don't know. In Rust. It's a Rust construct. No, it's a, a more general construct. Okay. okay, no, okay. So <laughs> supposedly even more people than actually put their hands up. Um, basic blocks is a concept from, yeah, let's say mostly compiler engineering actually. Um, what a basic block is, is a block of code that will always run sequentially. So there are no branches within it. Um, so the start of the block is usually reached, reached via some jump expression or go-to expression. And the end of the block itself is some sort of terminator, which can either be a return from a function or itself a jump to another basic block. So basically, basic blocks are what make up control flow graphs as you draw them, right? So if you have an if statement and you have the then and the else block, you'd have like some basic block, the decision which goes to either other basic blocks which then just run sequentially. Um, and that's what MIR is sort of built out of. Like you have those blocks that link to each other, um, oftentimes with go-to statements, but they also have, at least syntactically in the text form, ways to go to different basic blocks based on return values of functions or return situations of functions. Um, and we'll see that in a moment. The way to get MIR is pretty similar to getting HRR. You basically just type MIR instead of HRR, except if you're using cargo inspect, which has an pretty argument. But yeah, simply enough. So um, I warned you. <laughs> it's so simplistic that it's actually complex to read, which means it looks something like this. Um, 
what it does is it generates a lot of like these bindings, some of them. I don't even actually know why it generates them, because as far as I can tell, it's just assigning to one of them and then assigning that exact value to the next one. Um, I'm guessing that in the actual data structures, those are like ways to express moves and copies of the value, but it's like fairly hard to see, I think, in the actual textual representation. Um, like, let's see if we can actually find it. And because of it, like here, it just assigns one to zero and then zero. Okay, zero is actually the return value. Um, so what do I want to show in this? So um, I think one thing we can see is that stuff moved around a bit. Like our main function is certainly the very first thing we see in the output. Um, by the way, nice warning at the top, right? It, it says this is subject to change. It's for human consumption, but like don't don't trust this sort of right. Um, yeah, as I said, I don't find it too helpful to read. It does some, some interesting things, like it actually assigns two parts of the tuples, or of the, I think that's the range, actually. Um, instead of building it up immediately, it makes moves explicit. Like, you can see that the range is actually passed by move to the integrator function call. So that's something you can see in this syntax. Um, and as I said, it has, like, ways to tell you where you return from a function. Like, this arrow dash this arrow bb1 tells you that returning from that function takes you to basic block one, which is the one just below, actually, um, indicated by labels. So it's very, like, go-to-like, certainly. And it actually has go-to, as I said. It can just immediately go to another basic block. Um, right, other than that, I don't think there is much new to see here. It's, yeah. Why is it split up into high-level uh Immediate presentation and immediate level intermediate presentation. Um, so since I've not done too much compiler internal work, I can't tell you exactly. But like what's what's been floated is that mid-level intermediate representation made it a lot easier to implement certain features. Like if you just have a very basic language you need to operate on, um, in theory it becomes much easier to do optimizations and other things. And in particular, mid-level intermediate representation, people said was one of the requirements for all actually implementing non-electrical lifetimes, mm -hmm. because that would just have been incredibly hard on high-level intermediate representation, because it's like too abstract from from just having actual small scopes and all that. Um, yeah, so that's the reason. Like most things, I've, I've written at least one small optimization on MIR, um, and. As far as I've seen, most of those sort of small optimization kind of things are actually happening on MIR right now. HIR is used a lot for, I think, type checking is done completely on HIR, at which point it then is transformed into MIR, and borrow checking is done on MIR already. Which is also like that layering also explains why sometimes if you have errors in your type signatures, you won't get any borrow checker errors. And then once you have solved all your type errors, you get a bunch of borrow checker errors here. And that's the reason why that happens. Um, yes. Uh, high, level, um, high level intermediate representation was still valid trust. Um, uh, it it most I couldn't tell. It's very likely not guaranteed to be. I think the thing that it output in this case was actually there might have been a missing lab binding or something, but generally it is. But as I said, those are textual representations of data structures, and they're mostly like meant for human consumption. Um, it's sort of like it is an abstract syntax tree and then dumped into a form that a human could read. So it's not in a, it's certainly not guaranteed to be valid. Rust and it doesn't have to be in any way, shape, or form. Okay. It's like a data tree structure fundamentally. Okay. How do you identify the loop? There still in this representation? Um, oh yeah, that's actually a good question. So there must be a loop here, right? Um, so let me see real quick. We're calling next here, which is pretty much the top of our loop. And then at some point we must be comparing something, right? So that might also be interesting. So what this does is um, six is, if I look up at the top, we can at least go by the type. Six is some option of I32. 
So probably that is something like the return value of our next function. And actually, if we look here, yes, that is the return value of our next function, right? So we need to match over that in order to know whether we go to the next iteration or not. Um, so what we do is we get the discriminant of the enum, so the option enum. Discriminant meaning the value that tells you which variant the enum currently contains, either the sum or the non-variant. Um, so that's stored in 10, and then we do a switch int operation um, over the value 10, so over the discriminant. And then it has this like fancy syntax, whatever that is in the actual data structure, that says, okay, if it contains zero, go to basic block four. If it contains one, go to basic block six. And otherwise, go to basic block five. Um, basic block five, as I remember, is kind of interesting because basic block five is unreachable. Okay, cool. So if we have one of the variants that actually exist, um, it is either zero, which is the non-variant. It goes to basic block four, which then in the end returns from the function. Okay. And if it is one, which is the sum variant, it will go to basic block six, which is down here. Um, and basic block six does something that you also can do in the surface language. It takes our option, as we remember, on line six, right? Casts it to its sum variant because it now knows that it has to be the sum variant. It checked the discriminant before, right? So that's valid. Um, and takes the value in that, which is an i32. Then with that value, we move, that's what I was talking about before. It just moves that I cannot without knowing the data structure comprehend. Like it moves 9 to 11, moves 11 to 5, 5 to 12, 12 to 14, and then calls puts with 14. I have no idea why it has to do five moves to actually call the function, but it calls the function in the end, right? So that's our iteration value. And after calling the function, it goes to basic block seven. And then basic block seven finally does a better quote edge to basic block two, which is up here and, oh no, wait, um, I'm confused. No, this is basic, right. That was basic block two of an entirely different function, but it was basic two, uh, which is up here and then calls next again. So that's our backwards edge through the loop. So yeah, we do a lot of work, but it puts and then go to back up to the actual loop pad. Um, so as I said, you, you can do that on that representation. I think it's fairly intricate and fairly hard to read. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if, like how many people have actually followed that. <laughs> okay. Um, so next step would be going down to the LVM intermediate representation, which is um, something where it gets sort of fairly technically in terms of like compiler internals again. Um, LVM intermediate representation is a so-called infinite register machine. So you, well, let's say, <coughs> A way to look at it, a valid way, is you're assigned to an infinite number of variables um, and then use those variables. And the interesting thing about that is that it is a at least single synthetic assignment form like representation. Single synthetic assignment form is a concept from compiler design where you have just a single, well, as the name said, a single assignment to each variable. So you can't actually redefine variables. Um, the benefit of that is that it makes a lot of analysis much easier. Like if you have only one assignment, you know how long that well is life. Life meaning when the last point in time is where it was actually used because it can become life again because something else was reassigned to it or something like that. Um, and you can do various data flow analysis. You know the last point it's used is where that name last occurs um, and those kind of things. And the important thing about that, and I think we'll actually, yeah, since this is a loop, we'll definitely see it. Um, it has a single assignment statically, meaning you see, in, like in the syntax, only one point where that variable is assigned, but the value might actually differ depending on from which other basic block you entered the basic block defining that variable. Which sounds super abstract, but I'll, like we'll see an example for that in a moment. Um, other than just plain variables, it can access memory. Memory is accessed pretty much like in an C or plain assembly also via pointers held in registers. Um, I'm sort of using registers and variables interchangeably here, by the way. They're sort of the same thing in LOMIR, I guess. Um, so you can get stack memory or whatever, and with a call called a locker for stack memory, for example, it gives you a pointer, that pointer is stored in a variable, 
And then you have to do explicit read and write calls on that pointer to actually access memory in any way. Um, which is also the thing that makes it like not strictly a single static assignment form, because you can, of course, with those operations at hand, you can put variables in memory and redefine them as you want. They don't have to be like in a variable. And then you have optimizations that go from memory to registers and the other way around. Um, so the way to get that, and that actually also works in stable Rust, nicely enough, is you can pass dash dash emit LLVMIR, and I'll give you an input.ll file. Um, same thing also sort of works for, for cargo Rust C, in which case, by the way, it outputs to, I think, target release depths or something like that, which was a bit hard to find, but certainly workable. Um, so let's look at that. So that also looks, let's say, a bit scary. Um, and like to me personally, if you're just looking at this, what does code do? Um, a big trick of reading it, <laughs> the MIR is ignore the big blobs. Like here are a lot of definitions of actually like unwinding information for the compiler, um, some constants for various things. But like what we care about is the for loop in the main function, right? So let's jump to something called main. Um, here's our main function or at least the, the mangled name for it, the main function in the fork rate. Um, and then there's some code for it. And yeah, I'm actually, let me try something real quick. Um, right, I did that with odd compiling and release mode. So if you want to look at what actually, like if you're trying to do this for optimization or actually many other reasons because it's much more readable, um, it of course makes more sense to actually compile that code with optimizations enabled. Um, for Rust C, that is dash C op level equals two or three, two is the default, I think. Um, the default for, for release builds. For cargo, it's just cargo Rust C dash dash release as you would normally do, right, for release builds. Um, so, and since we have now an optimization of this, this should look a bit more accessible, actually. which it does. So, um, interestingly enough, this thing here is a bit hard to see because it's certainly a very loud syntax. That's a complete main function. Um, other functions have been added to the code, like there is a symbol to um, actually called length start, which is the first thing that's called in a program when it runs, which then in turn calls the main function. And there is like an exception handling personality function which you might know from C++. And there is like helpers to, to start lifetimes and end lifetimes. But what we're interested in is, is pretty much just the snippet, which is our main function. So as I said, like ignore all of the complicated stuff you don't understand and try to like find your main function. Um, that's actually the wrong main function though. Because I'm confused. This is the one we're looking for. Um, Right, so that's also something that's that's a bit interesting. Like there's one main symbol, which is like the main entry point of the problem program, which in turn then calls the Rust main function, um, wherever that design is there. So um, LLVMIR is also technically represented into basic blocks, but it's far less explicit than MIR is because it actually has things like fall through. Like if there is not an explicit branch, it will continue executing at the basic block. Um, like MIR, it names basic block with labels. So there's a start label here, there's a basic block four and a basic block six. Um, the reason for the numbers not being contiguous is that this is after optimization. So the original LVMIR had contiguous basic blocks numbers, but then we went to various optimization passes. Some basic blocks might have gotten merged, might have gotten removed because they did nothing, and things like that. This is what we end up with. And um, we can actually follow through on to our loop here. So we, since it's only a few functions, a um, few lines of code. Um, so we start at the start basic block and immediately branch to basic block six. And basic block six does um, something I talked about it a moment ago which is 
a, value, um, a register might have different values depending on which basic block you came from, which is done by a fine node. So the, the way to understand that is if you have a loop um, and you have like, your induction variable, right, your E loop count, there are basically two values it can have. Either it's the value that it got initialized to, like at the start of the for loop, or it has the value of the previous iteration of the for loop. Right, the one that you just incremented in a way and then went back to the top. Um, and a fine note is a way to express that. So the so fine note tells you, okay, there are multiple values that this variable can be assigned to now, um, depending on what basic block you came from. And that's either if you came from, that was entirely the wrong key to press. Um, if you came from the start basic block, which was the one that we came from now, the value of this register is zero, always. If you came from basic block six, which is the basic block we're in right now, so the loop itself, the value is that of the register zero. Um, and like going through that, you might see what that means. So register zero is defined on the next line, um, and it doesn't add. LLVMIR has a lot of modifiers and like meta information attached to everything. In this case, NUW and NSW is non, no unsigned wrap and no signed wrap. So it guarantees to the code um, generation that this addition will never wrap the maximum value of the integer. Right? And if you're interested in that, you can see those sort of things easily in LVMIR. Um, like what the compiler actually assumes about your code and what you could try to tell it in some ways. Um, Okay, so what it does is, is takes our fancy value up here and adds one to it. So, as I said, that's pretty clearly our loop counter, um, and on each iteration, sensibly, we add one to our loop counter. So then we call tail call fast cc um, puts. It's a bit hard to see, like with those names, but that's our puts function, right? Um, and it calls us with the original value of our loop counter. Sensibly, because in the first iteration we want to call it with zero and not with the incremented value of one, right? Um, then it does a comparison. I compare, I think, yeah, should be signed comparison for equality and compares our incremented loop counter with 255. So our loop went from zero up to 255, non including 255. So that's basically our, yeah, as it says, exit condition for the loop. And then, depending on whether that's zero or one, we branch to two different basic blocks. If it is equal, so we'll have to exit the loop because this was the last iteration, it branches to basic block four, which returns from the function, simple enough. Otherwise, it branches to basic block six, at which point the loop continues. And we see that we got here to our loop counter from the same basic block which we're just in basic block six, so it assigns the loop counter to our incremented value of the loop counter. Um, which is a way of like, there is clearly just a single assignment statically in that basic block to that register. But since you can tell it to assign it the value of different registers depending on where it came from, you get that behavior that dynamically this is an increasing loop counter. Um, yeah, and that's, I think the takeaway from that already um, is probably, yes, that's pretty much a C loop. Like, you have one basic block, you check at the bottom, is that the last value? If it is, return, if, yeah, if it is return, otherwise execute that same basic block. Like, there is no call to next there anymore. There is no fancy matching of an option anymore. And pretty much nothing else, right? This is, we increment a counter by one and call a function. So that's pretty good, I think. I see a lot of confused phrases, which is sort of what I expected, but like, do, do you have a question in mind for me? <laughs> do you know where this by comes from? Like, is there, is there a machine instruction that you can use? On um, so the question was, if I know where that phi comes from, that phi is a concept specifically of single static assignment form. Yeah. 
like it is really just exists for this kind of um, compiler intermediate representations. And it's then using during code generation, like expanded appropriately by the compiler, um, which usually just means that, I mean, a valid way to do that is that variable is a register. And on the backwards edge to the same basic block, you make sure that that register gets the next value it's supposed to get like before actually branching back to it. Um, so you, you can do like a lot of fancy stuff with register allocation, in this case, CPU register allocation um, and that kind of thing. But yeah, it's, it's really if you read, I don't actually know what the original paper for that is, but if you read up on single static assignment form, five notes will come up um, invariantly. Yeah. Maybe a stupid question, but is it sensible to write the same function in C and compile it with Clang and look at the same intermediate level representation and look, for example, you said there are some guarantees uh, given through these mm -hmm. instructions. Are these different in C and uh, Rust code? Right. Um, that's absolutely sensible to do. Um, I've actually another example where I did pretty much that. Um, I guess I'll, I'd like to skip it for like during the talk, but like we have no face after the talk. I'd be happy to do just that and, and compare it. That's totally reasonable actually. Yeah. Um, just see like what, what LVMR actually looks like for, for C code. Um, for now, let's actually like step ahead to the last step, which is assembly. Um, yeah. Oh. I Sorry. have one more uh, question. So if I had some, I would call something which uh, could panic, uh, do a recoverable panic, would mm -hmm. uh, would there be some additional instructions for the unwinding? Um, that is a very good question. Certainly there would be something for the unwinding. Um, I'm not admittedly very familiar with how panic actually works and like unwinding personality functions and all that. Um, what you usually see, and that's also something that we easily can try after the talk if we want to, um, is that there is code that's a bit separate from the actual function, like usually at the very bottom of it, that will do a lot of the panic handling. And that, like, in the middle of the function, there's usually some check that checks for the condition that should panic. And if a panic excuse occurs, you jump to that panic handling code. Um, and there are sometimes multiple blocks of it, like for different cases of panic and that kind of thing. So the overhead that happens in a panic is visible in this? Yes. Oh. Should Thank be. you. Should be. Okay, cool. Um, so assembly. So we can finally scare the last of you. Um, so assembly is sort of the, the textural representation of actual instructions interpreted by the CPU, right? And um, more often than not, they sort of take the form, you have an opcode, so an operation you want to perform, and then two or three operands that you want to perform that operation on. Um, and like I, I assume we all have some very, very basic understanding of CPUs at least, like you have a set of registers, usually a fixed set and not an infinite set, like as they used to have. Um, and you can access them, like you can do operations on them, you can add different registers together, write to use it to another one, those kind of things. Um, and yeah, I guess we'll see a quick sample of that. Um, the way to output assembly is very much the same as LVMIR, you just write emit asm instead of emit LVMIR. Um, you can in theory do that for like various CPUs and dialects just by, by applying cross-compilation object to Rust-C, which is also sort of interesting. Um, and I failed to do for some reason yesterday. I would have sort of liked to show that. Um, so yeah, let's, let's dive into a bit of assembly, I guess. Um, so not only because I, I didn't manage to cross-compile it, but also because I think it's most useful to most people. This is x86-64 assembly, so 64-bit Intel CPUs. Um, and again, there's sort of obviously a lot of code added to this from what we had originally. Like everything that implements Printlen had to be added to this assembly and to this binary obviously, so Printlen can actually happen. That's also our language start symbol again. And somewhere in here should be our main function. Um, so let's see, that looks like our main function. 
So doing it, like there's technically another way to get to something. You could also call object dump dash D. So you're usually, yeah, you're usually object dump if you're familiar with that, um, on the finished binary. But it's much nicer to actually let LLVM give you the assembly because the assembly of LLVM output still has a lot of annotations to it. Um, I think not that many for, for RESTC actually. The variant that Clang outputs usually even has some comments which variable names certain things came from, as I think I've seen. Um, so our main function in this case is just this block. So it's again relatively short, certainly much shorter than MIR. Um, right. So I, I say we'll ignore that push because that's for like application binary interface reasons that I don't want to get into in like this talk. But everything after that should be our actual loop. Um, starting out with an XR of EDI with EDI, which is a fancy way to set the EDI registers to zero. Like, if you've never thought about that, if you XR a value with itself, it invariantly becomes zero. Um, and for some reason, that's become idiomatic in assembly to do, to clear a register instead of just setting it to the value zero, presumably because it's faster. Um, and then we get to sort of fancy things. The next instruction is a so-called LIA, which is sort for something I forgot my uh, Load effective address. Yeah, thank you. Um, so load effective address, and you'll see like a lot of suffixes to the instructions, which is specifically for x86 tells you the length of the value they operate on. Um, like, okay, yeah, I should actually say that. What's particular in x86 world is that you not only have registers to work on, but each register has a certain set of sub-registers, which are smaller and contained within it. Um, like classically, how does that story go? You have an AL and AH register, which are both 8-bit, and then part of the AX register, which are then 16-bit, which is a part of the lower part of the EAX register, so the extended AX register is then 32-bit. And then now we have 32, four, so we have 64-bit CPUs. Now we have RAX, which is which EAX is the lower part of. Um, and then you can replace the, the letter A with B, C, and D. And for 64-bit, we also got some numbered registers and all that. But yeah, that's that's the part that might be confusing. And like those suffixes indicate how large the registers we're working on actually are. Like L is the 32-bit value, which we also can tell by the fact that this register is prefixed by E for extended, um, and those kinds of things. So layer is an interesting instruction because what it actually is supposed to do is it's supposed to load an effective address. Meaning one of the operands is um, an address calculation, and the other operand is where you store the calculated address. So the way that's done is, um, I think the full syntax of this is something like, like this. So what that computes is it takes the presumably pointer in RDI and then adds to that the offset in RAX multiplied by the value of four and to the result of that adds another one. So that's sort of fancy, right, for a single instruction. You can do two additions one with a register and one with a constant, and you can multiply that one register with another constant. Um, which is exactly the reason why people more often than not don't actually use that to calculate addresses, but to calculate new values. Um, and in this case, we calculate the value RDI incremented by one, uh, which is, is like an incredibly like verbose way to say at one, but sure, why not? Um, so at this point, we have set EDI. <coughs> Bless you. Um, we set EDI to zero. Then EDI, as I said, is the lower part of the RDI register. So we add one to that zero and store the result in the EBX register. Um, uh, x86 kind OK, right, then. Then we call the putz function. Um, important thing to know here is how are parameters actually passed to functions? And the way that's done is that there's a defined order of registers for each parameter. 
So in x86-64, that's the first parameter is always in the RDI register. The second is in the RSI register and then some others. Um, and RDI in our case is still set to zero, right? Because we cleared it up here. Then we added one to it, but didn't store that back to RDI, but stored that to EBX. So RDI is our initial loop counter value still, and that's passed to the pods function. Um, after that, we move the incremented value, so RDI plus one, from EBX to EDI. So the direction here is from left to right, if you haven't um, caught up onto that yet. Then we do a compare. Compare is also, at least on x86, a bit interesting. Um, they don't return a result in a register or anything, but they set certain so-called flags in the CPU, so global, usable state sort of a CPU, which tells you things about the results of the last operation. In particular, it tells you whether the result of that operation was zero, um, which is the way that this compare is implemented. What that actually does is it subtracts the immediate from the register, um, but doesn't store the result anyway, but just sets those flags. So fundamentally, we subtract 254 from EBX, our loop counter, um, and then if the result of that subtraction is zero, the zero flag is globally set. Um, and the next instruction makes use of that. It checks the zero flag, sometimes also called the equal flag, exactly for that reason. Um, and if the whole thing is not equal, slash not zero, we branch back to the same basic block up here and do our next loop iteration. So that's our backward edge for that. Um, and if it is equal, we fall through, pop RBX that we pushed up there, so we put that on the stack up here, got it back from the stack down here, and return from the function. And that's all there is to that, um, which is admittedly very complex. Any any questions about that? No. Okay. It looks as if one register too much is involved. Mm. Which one? I, I I don't know, but but I see uh, at least EBX and ED one EDI. So why are there two? So there is very similar to actually what we saw in the LLVM IR. You have the loop counter and then the value after the loop counter was incremented, right? Um, and EBX is, well, for some part at least of this loop, holding the already incremented value while RDI is the not yet incremented value. Um, RDI slash EDI, as I said, that one is a subset of the other. Um, it's actually a good question why that happens. Let me think about that. I think that's not technically necessary. Um, but if you're looking at assembler, I think one thing that's always like a good excuse to throw at people, um, if that's the truth in this case, I don't know, is instruction scheduling. Um, and instruction scheduling is pretty much a fancy way to say, yeah, it's compiler magic, slash it's CPU magic. Um, because what that means is that depending on the order in which you execute instructions, it might be faster or not because certain computational units in the CPU are in use or not. Um, so presumably it decided that doing the addition of one before calling puts, which it could easily do afterwards, right, um, is in some way more efficient than doing the addition after that and saving a register. On the other hand, it's an interesting question because the LLVM IR was written exactly like that and the LLVM IR itself doesn't know anything about instruction setting in x86 assembly, at least usually not. So there may be other reasons for that that I'm just not aware of. Yeah. I think one thing that plays into that is that uh, the instructions were um, emitted with the thought in mind that this loop will be executed at least once. So it inevitably has to uh, increase that one. I think it would look uh, different, or may look different, uh, if uh, the compiler would, couldn't be sure of that. So 
dropping the uh, increment for the first check of the loop uh, condition. Right, that's actually, that's an interesting point. Like I'm not sure whether that actually makes the code again better, so to say, because you could still save a register, but like, again, telling whether that that's better or not is sort of a matter of heuristics and looking at CPU manuals and like doing proper compiler engineering. Um, but certainly if you actually had to check for the very first iteration, you would also have to check like, is zero not 255? And the compiler knows that, yeah, zero is definitely not 255, so we can always do the add instead of checking that first. So that might be one of the reasons to do that, why ever that's actually useful, right? But at least it's an indicator that it actually did realize that it could increment at least once, which is also interesting. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, so I have two other examples, and I think because this actually took way longer than I expected it to, I'm going to run to them rather quickly, but like sort of show the part that I think is interesting. Um, the first one is an implementation of the Project Euler problem number one. So if you're not familiar with Project Euler, it's like a database of problems that you can try to solve to sort of jog your minds, I guess. Um, and technically, you're also not, not necessarily supposed to like publicly show solutions for them, but I think the very first one is easy enough that we can deal with that. Um, so this is sort of a very rusty implementation of it, using a lot of like sugar and, in this case, iterative adapters. So we start out with um, a range iterator from zero to a thousand. And oh yeah, right. Our task is go from zero all numbers from zero to thousand and add up all numbers that are dividable by either three or five, right? Um, so we start off with a range from zero to a thousand, then filter that range for all numbers that are evenly divisible by three and five, and then sum up all those numbers. So no for loops, no nothing, just plain iterator adapters in Rust. Um, pretty nice. So obvious question is that actually, like that calls a lot of functions, that calls a lot of iterators and all that stuff. Is that actually as nice as the C variant of that? Or is that like just a bunch of overhead and you wouldn't really want to do that if that was performance critical? Um, so let's look at that. I have not actually put that on slides because everything is too much. <laughs> um, so where do I start? So just to prove that, in the Rust file, there is exactly that implementation. Um, and then I actually haven't, yeah, okay. So let's run Rust-C, um, emit asm. Oh, no, I can't do really something. Let's say the opt level is two, and we want to compile all our Rs. Um, there is an equals missing. Okay. So that creates, which I think I didn't mention before, an .s file for assembly. Um, and again, lots of things that we don't necessarily care about, and then somewhere our main function. Um, and you notice that jumped straight down to assembly because, well, let's say for one, for the interest of time, <coughs> but also in the other stages, there's not, not much interesting happening. Like down to MIR, it, we definitely know that it will still call functions for iterator adapters because no optimization of that sort happens on MIR. Um, so we could, like, we could go to LVMIR or we could go straight to assembly. Um, is that the correct main function? I do, s no, don't think so. That's our actual main function. Um, and I started this quite a while yesterday, actually, because there's some very interesting things. So let me point out some stuff. So, um, First interesting thing it does, it zeroes ECX, and ECX is also very classically actually our loop counter. Um, is it in this case? I think so. Was it? Yeah. So, and then it has those two sort of magical looking variables up here. Um, and I can also like show them in hex, which you probably can't read. It's just a CCCC, CCCD. So, and this one is AAAAAB. But it all looks sort of kind of magical, right? Um, and the next thing it does, it zeroes ESI, 
I think I probably was wrong about these. Yes. So what happens then is sort of interesting instructions. Like there is no modulo in there, and there's also no division in there. Um, but after actually staring at this for a while and testing things out yesterday with Ike, what we came up with is that those two instructions, um, so multiplying with one of the magic constants that starts in R8, followed by a shift by 43 to the right, is actually doing integer division by five. Um, <laughs> which is really not obvious to see, right? And uh, like the things, like that's one of those things where I always say, yeah, that's compilers, right? Because they know division in CPUs is usually horrendously slow. Um, so you try to find other ways to do that division. And in this case, they would buy multiplications followed by a shift. Um, there's some, I guess there's multiple ways to look at this. I think one of the ones that's sort of helpful is if you take that constant. Um, and actually, is a shift decent? I don't think so. Like, sh right shifts is the same thing as dividing to that by that power of 2, right? You've probably heard of that. So if I divide that by 2 to the power of 34, what comes up is it's 0 0.2. So that somehow gives you an intuition like 0.2 is 1 divided by 5, right? So that's sort of the same thing as fixed point multiplication by 0 0.2, and then throwing away all the digits you didn't want. <laughs> and, and in that way is a very fancy way of like dividing by 5, integer division by 5. Um, so next thing that happens is interesting uses of LEA again. Um, this syntax, if you've forgotten it, which you probably have, is take RDI and add to that RDI multiplied by 4. So that's RDI multiplied by 5, right? <laughs> um, so this is multiplication by 5, also a very obvious way to do that. Um, and we saw the result of that in EDX. And then the next instructions are pretty much the same thing. Um, we multiply by a magic constant. In this case, this is division by 3. Um, and then multiply by three with the same fancy LEA trick. And what then follows is that we compare um, our original loop value, right? So of that iteration with the values that we've done interdivision inter followed by multiplication on. And if those are the same, we know that they were evenly divisible because our integer division didn't throw away non-significant digits. <coughs> um, and yeah, then there's some interesting things here, like if they were not equal, we actually zero our loop counter, so what we're going to add is zero instead of the current number. Um, and then there's other fancy stuff here, like conditional move when equal, um, which does basically yeah, a very similar thing, like it moves our loop counter to the value we're going to add, but only if the modulo was equal to zero, or the division followed by the multiplication was equal, right? Um, and yeah, it, it basically ends up doing an add here with that value. ESI is going to be our sum. Um, add one to the loop counter, compare the loop counter to a thousand. Write our incremented loop counter to our actual loop counter, and then branch back to the head of that loop. Um, I don't actually intend for you to get most of that, but just like to see the interesting bits. Um, as I said, I have one example where I want to compare that to C, so let's do that. I've actually got a C implementation of that here, um, which looks fairly different because it's actually like a loop and I have a sum variable, I've made sure that the types match up. So I know that on this architecture unsigned int is a 32-bit unsigned integer, which is what I was using in Rust. Um, I'm iterating over the same numbers. I'm doing, like in this case, an if with those modulus equals to zero and then summing all that up, printing it at the end. So let's look at what Clang gives us with that. Um, Set, yeah, so dash s for clang is give us assembly, dash o2 is op level 2, basically. And then we'll grant that on my logic. 
And that gives us the same file, um, but now compiled from Euler.c instead of Rust code. And we'll look at our main function again. And interestingly enough, um, it is very similar, but it also realized something that apparently LLVM couldn't realize on the Rust code. Because it still does fancy multiplication followed by right shift, but it's instead of doing that with 32-bit values, it's now only doing that with 16-bit values. Or doing that with 16-bit values and the result is a 32-bit value, whereas the Rust version did that on 32-bit values with a 64-bit result. And what that tells me is that Clang somehow realized that values would never be more than a thousand. And therefore, that was sufficient precision. Um, and in some way, for Rust, that information must have gotten lost, and the optimizer couldn't actually use it to choose smaller constants. Which would actually be something, I guess, interesting to like report as a bug or look into otherwise, so that information doesn't get lost for the Rust iteration. Um, so it's, it's otherwise very similar. It multiplies um, by the values, divides by the values, adds the whole thing up, um, just with smaller constants. So yeah, I think it's, it's fair to say that is other than not realizing what the loop, that, like, what, the, what the valid range of that variable is, it's fair to say that this is pretty much equal in performance to the trust version. Um, also interestingly, if anyone cares, if we compile that with GCC, right, um, we interestingly enough, just like Rust, get 32-bit constants. So GCC, for some reason, also either doesn't think it's worthwhile to use smaller constants or doesn't realize it. Um, also, there are negative and there are some other idiosyncrasies in here, but yeah, this is pretty much just the same code that Rust-C gave us, interestingly enough. So the very one, last one I want to show, um, as this is in a very different direction and I'm not even I might quickly show a summary, but not, not like really look into it, like just a single line of this actually was interest me. Um, so this is sort of what actually sparked me doing this talk, because I was sitting at work and sort of wondering about bitfield. And bitfield is a macro, a crate and a macro, um, to generate bitfields. So structs over a certain integer type, and you get getters and setters implemented for sort of bit ranges within that integer. Um, so in this case, there is like, that was a register of a certain chip I was trying to program for. Um, and it has three fields, the SDS field, TDM field, and diff fields. And yes, that are not really telling names, but um, let's go with it because that's what they actually were called in the data sheet, right? And one of them is bits six and five, the other is bits four and three, and the last one is bits two through zero. Um, and what I wanted to do is I wanted to use bitfield because that's sort of for setting specific values in that register sort of useful instead of doing all the bit manipulation yourself. But also, since I wanted to use that for initialization of the chip um, and use that a lot during, for example, volume changes where someone might turn a encoder quickly and the value needs to exchange quickly, um, I didn't want it to actually call functions and like always build up constants using um, bit expressions. Because fundamentally, like if I did want to do that by hand, I could tell you that that constant is just OX53 or something like that, right? And if it's going to do bit manipulation at runtime, I'd probably rather not use that macro. So that was sort of what interested me in that, like what does that compile down to? is initializing it to zero followed by three sets in the end just a constant or does it actually call three functions or does it inline the functions but the bit manipulation on the value zero is still there to build up that correct value or whatever does it do. Um, and for that one again since we know we, well actually for this one let's do a few things. Let's um, start out with just doing the macro expansion. Because that's already sort of interesting, right? How do functions that this generates actually look? Um, now I just need to remember the syntax, pretty expanded. 
set unstable options. So that's our like expanded code. And from just for comparison, we gave it this, like the name for the structs, we told it to implement debug, which is also sort of a nice feature, and then just a bit ranges. And what it did is it created a struct, fair enough, actually, um, let me just dump that into an editor. So, um, so certainly enough, it created a struct over that exact integer type, um, and it created some functions. And these functions use other methods on the struct that it apparently created called bit range and set values into it. So let's look a bit up. So here's the debug implementation that it also created quite nicely and as you would do. And here is set bit range and set, no, bit range and set bit range functions. Um, so, okay, that's what that macro expands to. So actually not only function calls with bit manipulations, but function calls that call other functions, actually various of them, and sort of a lot of abstraction. Um, so yeah, from that point, still I'm interested to see whether does that, that compiles down to a constant or not. Um, so next step, and I've not actually tried that, I think, um, would probably be like, let's just emit LLVMIR, because LLVMIR is the first thing that went to optimization. So conceivably, we could already see an LLVMIR. Okay, that assigns a constant to register, and if that's the case, cool, done. Um, so, <laughs> as I said, that sort of, wait. Obviously, I want to compile that in release mode, because otherwise, no optimizations, right? Um, so that helpfully creates in target release depths. Am I green? Yeah. Um, actually, multiple LL files. And I'll just open all of them and see which one of them we actually want. Um, this one has a bitfields main function, so I guess that's not a bad start. And if we look at this a bit, is that I'm always so confused by those main functions. Yeah, that should be the right one, though. Um, we see that it creates a DI value, which is what our variable was called, um, on the stack with an illocker. Then it stores to that DI value the number zero, and then it does three function calls, and then calls send SPI on the result. So at this point, actually, Interestingly enough, that doesn't seem to be very well optimized. Um, and since I know that there should actually be a constant, and I'm not sure which of the LL files I want, let me actually just delete those that are there so I can make sure I got an optimized one. Um, see, that's the fun part. Finding the actual output. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what you want to see in demonstrations, right? Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Make it way easier to find the actual output. Let's release admit LAMIR. And please find me something that's called .ll. Target release. Okay. I can deal with that. Okay, so I guess that's something I should find interesting. Um, so I'm not going to stare at this for too long because that's boring. But okay, what we see in this dot alpha that actually does three function calls and then finally calls send SPI. So let's guesstimate that it actually doesn't optimize at this point um, and go down, down one more layer because, well, maybe we get lucky, right? 
Um, so let's emit asm instead. And then open all those S files. Which are also way more than I got yesterday. That's sort of interesting. And see that it still does those function calls. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to bother myself with it too much. Um, so yeah, apparently that does not optimize. Um, which is an interesting result because it did yesterday. <laughs> um, <laughs> but fair enough, I think I did actually also do a compiler update. But that's an interesting regression if that is actually a regression. Or maybe I'm just too stupid to type release or whatever. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's sort of the way you would approach those things. Like there should be a constant here. There is not, there is function calls. Um, so I know that maybe I shouldn't actually use it in my production code. Or maybe I should, because I did check the ARM assembly, which I'm actually running, and that had a constant. Um, yeah. When, when you did it yesterday, um, those different files that were coming out of there, yeah. are those like different iterations or different steps, or um, is it just... Uh... So, interestingly enough, that's also something that's different from yesterday, because I was very pleased yesterday that it actually only gave me a single file. Um, and I have already seen those, yeah, I'm going to output multiple ll.s files. I am not entirely sure what they are. From what I can tell, um, they don't really overlap. Like there are different functions and different symbols in each of them. And like most of them don't actually have a main function. So that's certainly not an optimization step or anything like that. Um, my assumption is that those might actually be artifacts from like partial compilation and caching and things like that. Or it might actually be things that get compiled and assembled separately and then later linked to the final binary in some way. When it was compiling down to the, to the constant assigning right. uh, yesterday, were there also function calls in the upper layer intermediate? So were they then like optimized away uh, somewhere or when did the optimization into the into the constant occur? I mean, at what stage did the compiler rec rec recognize, oh, this uh, this is just a constant and I can throw all the, the, the function calls away? Do you remember? I, yeah, I, I do remember that I didn't actually look. Like, this talk is sort of done very much with a hot needle, admittedly. Um, I know I really only looked at the assembly for that yesterday. But I would expect it to be optimized away in the LVM IR. Like all the optimizations that do the inlining and constant folding and all that should happen on LVM IR. So the, 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 the high level intermediate representation and, and of, of the, of the uh, cargo of the rest was still with function calls. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, it's, as far as I know, it's certainly in the planning to do those kind of optimizations also potentially on MIR, in particular because the hope is that that would get compilation times down, because currently we're dumping a lot of fairly non-optimal LVM IR at LVM. And if we could first reduce things in the MIR world, which we can do potentially much faster, we could give a lot better and a lot smaller LVM IR to LVM but that's still not really implemented, at least not a lot of it. Um, and I think constant folding is something that certainly doesn't really happen yet. Um, might in theory with Miri and a lot of like interpretation things from Miri coming up, but not right now as far as I know. And maybe by me, just, just this trick with this multiplication and bit shifting for the modular operation. How, 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 how long will it go? I mean, uh, at a certain point, if I give like modulo 1735, I have no idea. At a certain point, it will need to revert to division. I would mm. expect. I would expect. Right. Um, so, uh, um, any idea how far this goes up? Or, uh... So, um, the question for the recording was, up to what number does it actually expand modulus to like those optimization sort of? Um, I don't know. My suspicion is that it will do that as long as it can. Meaning, since it's doing multiplication, it's limited by the representable values in the 64-bit register. Um, and I would assume that at a point where 
it knows that that would overflow. So based on the range of the value that it's multiplying, if it has information about that, um, and the range of the value that it's multiplying with, it should be able to make like assumptions of when that will be the case. And I guess that would be the limit of that. Okay, um, right, other, yeah. other questions, or if that's not the case, we can sort of do a more relaxed, less talky version of this and look at things we want to look at or just talk among ourselves and socialize. Question? Yeah. If I'm not writing a compiler, so if I'm not writing a compiler, is there any benefit to look at those intermediary steps instead of looking straight to the assembly? Is there anything, any extra information that I'm getting out of it? Um, if you're not writing a compiler, say. that is a good question. Um, to me personally, I think some of them can be easier to read. Like a lot of people aren't fairly um, well versed in assembly, and in particular, like if you for some reason are doing that for various architecture, like the LVMIR will always be roughly the same, but the assembly will be very different. So I think that's one potentially benefit of it. Um, other than that, what you could get away from that, but it really is like sort of an interesting question if that helps you if you're not writing the compiler yourself is. You can see, at least in the LMAI, but also at higher levels, what invariants your compiler knows about. Like things like the no unsigned wrap and all that. Um, and if you were assuming some things and were assuming optimizations based on them, like for example, that the compiler knows that your multiplication cannot wrap, um, you might be able to give it hints in the surface language by writing an assert or something like that that will actually tell it that those things can't happen and like add invariance to the whole stack which enable other optimizations. So that could be a benefit too. Okay. Good, then um, thanks for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.